During my time in college, I had a friend whose dad owned an 800-acre piece of land in eastern Texas. In the past, he leased it out to hunters and paper companies, but was no longer doing it. He had built a cabin on the land a few years before and would let us go out there from time to time to mess around. It served as a great way to relax from the pressures of school and getting closer to nature. The spring break of 1997, we loaded up our trucks and headed for the cabin. Our plans included shooting guns, drinking beer, and other things rednecks like us do in the woods. Our first morning kept us pretty busy cleaning the cabin and moving all our stuff inside. Around dinner, we made a big fire outside and cooked a bunch of steaks and fried potatoes. We skipped desserts and broke open some beers. The sun went down not long after and for the remainder of the evening we got loaded and passed around a joint or two. At some point in the night I heard a shuffling noise outside and went out to check on it. The fire was barely burning at that point and just outside of its light I swore I could see the shape of a man standing completely still. From what I could tell he was facing me, perhaps waiting to see what I would do. I blinked my eyes real hard to get a clearer look but my position and the lack of light made it hard to see clearly. The shape continued to stand still, so I decided I'd walk up a little closer in hopes of getting a better picture. The thought terrified me, but I was transfixed by the being, or perhaps I was still too intoxicated to make wise decisions. I took two steps forward, but was distracted by a voice behind me. My friend had woken up and noticed the door was wide open so he got out of bed and saw me walking around the fire. His voice caused me to jump a little, but I soon realized who it was speaking. I asked him if he saw the figure on the other side of the fire pit. He just laughed at me and said I must be so stoned I was seeing things. We laughed it off and returned to bed. On my way, I turned back to take one more look, but the shape was no longer there. I chuckled to myself and went back to sleep. The next morning, I wrote the whole experience off as the result of too much fun and went on with my day. We spent the first half of it fishing at the big pond. Post-lunch was shooting guns and one guy's compound bow that he had just bought. The beers and smoke were broken out after dinner. A game of poker was attempted but soon cancelled in favor of another evening telling lies around the fire. On one of my many trips to relieve myself that night... I was spooked by the sound of a stick breaking close by and noped it back to the fire. The look of fear on my face made the other guys laugh their butts off. I tried to explain what had happened but was quickly reminded that we weren't the only creatures in the woods. The reasoning seemed sound so I accepted it. Not long after, we were standing around, involved in some deep discussion, and I turned to speak to the guy on my left. What I saw caused me to clench up so tight I could have snapped a steel rod with my sphincter. Standing within a few steps behind my friend was another man I did not recognize. It was like he appeared out of nowhere. What made it creepier was that he was staring intently at the back of his head, almost like he was trying to bore through it with his eyes. I remained frozen stiff. The longer I looked at him... I realized he was the same being I saw lingering outside the light of the fire the night before. He was average height with a long, unkempt beard. My friend continued rambling about whatever, unaware of his shadow. After several long seconds, the stranger turned to me with a blank expression and walked away. This was when my friend finally noticed my horrified look. When he spoke, the thrall of fear was released and I began pointing and rambling about what I had just witnessed. He and my other friend laughed at me again. There was no way I was seeing things this time. I described the man, and one of them suggested he was a Bigfoot. Despite my protestations, no one was buying it, and I eventually cut my losses and shut up. However, I wasn't beat. Their mockery had made me even more determined to prove the stranger's existence. The next two days were quiet, no stranger in other words, but I kept my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. By our fifth morning, I was beginning to question my sanity. I'd seen this mysterious being stalking around us twice, and now it had suddenly disappeared. I resolved to put my quest on the back burner until some new evidence arose. 
My friend's dad had mentioned him and owner of one of the surrounding properties had spotted a small group of wild hogs running through his land, so we grabbed our rifles and went on the search for them. A mile or so, down one of the property's many roads, we came across some hog wallows and knew we were on the scent. We went up the road, now on foot tracking them. Another mile on, we stumbled upon three large hogs rooting up the ground and prepared to make bacon. Two of us chambered around as quiet as possible on our rifles and took aim. I was less than a second from saying three and pulling the trigger when the loud crack of another rifle filled the air followed closely by a burst of wood and bark above my friend's head. It took a moment for it to register that we were being shot at. A few seconds later, another crack and strike, this time even closer to my friend. We weren't going to wait for a third. The friend who appeared to be the target led us down a side trail that led back to the cabin. No more shots followed as we fled. However, instead of finding safety at the camp, the shots began again. Seeing no other option, we hopped into my truck and hauled it out of there. This was a time just before the commonality of cell phones, so we had to drive the 20 miles to town to get help. After we explained the situation, we returned to the property a few hours later with some deputies. We approached slowly and remained in the cars when we parked. We waited to see if the shots would start again, but nothing happened. A cursory look around counted three holes in the cabin and another two in my buddy's windshield. Perhaps the worst was that all of our camping stuff, sleeping bags and such, were spread out all over the ground. Luckily, we'd smoked everything the night before, so the police were none the wiser. Nothing was missing but a box of 3030 ammo and, strangely, my sleeping bag and wool blanket. A theory began to form in the deputy's mind that we had stumbled upon a squatter or poacher camping out on the property for whatever reason. They acted as if they were going to let it go, but once my friend's dad who owned the land heard about it, he put pressure on them to start a search. This was about the time I repeated my story of seeing someone lurking around the cabin. No one was laughing now, and my story was finally being taken seriously by somebody. The search was led around the property by my friend's dad, School had already begun again by the time it took place. It continued for a full week, but nothing other than a few old camps were found. It was assumed that he knew the heat would be on him after the shooting incident and he moved on. During the course of the investigation, several avenues were followed to ID the stranger like escaped cons, but he remains unidentified to this day. Because of the chance of another attack, our trips to the property ended. The next year we tried to camp out somewhere else, but it wasn't the same and our nature getaways died out. Within five years, my friend's dad had a heart attack and lost interest in the cabin. The paper company's lease were renewed and the land's trees had been used to make paper and pulpwood products ever since. Each time I jot down a quick note, I'm reminded of our awesome trips and especially the odd and terrifying week that caused them to stop. I do once or twice a year, talk to my old college friends on the phone. As far as he's heard, that crazy stranger still hasn't been caught. We sometimes theorize as to his origins and where he may have ended up. I, however, often take this much further when I'm alone. I wonder why our so-called strangers seem to focus so much of his anger onto my friend and, perhaps, far more concerning... Is he still out there waiting for his chance to finish what he began all those years ago? This is a recounting of a terrifying incident that three of my friends experienced during the summer after our junior year in high school. I very nearly became part of a tale myself, but a scheduled shift at the movie theater saved me. They showed up at my house earlier that day asking if I wanted to go with them into the woods to explore an area we had yet to search, but I had to work later that evening, so I had to decline. It's been over 25 years since this occurred, therefore not all that happened can be remembered, but I'll do my best. Looking back now at the way life was then, I can positively say things have changed greatly for kids. 
My neighborhood was its own self-contained city on the edge of the city limits. At the end of the 60s, some idealistic developer got the crazy idea to buy up hundreds of rolling acres of prairie and forest land out in the middle of nowhere. He created a little suburban sprawl for the coming rise of manufacturing and the people needed to fill those jobs. The factories did come, Johnson & Johnson, Folgers Coffee, places such as that, but within 30 years they would begin to leave just as quickly. The children of these factory workers found themselves separated from their peers in the rest of the city and with nothing better to do, took to the woods surrounding them to explore and discover nature much as their distant ancestors who settled this land hundreds of years before. I was one of those children and so were my three friends who would make the discovery on one of these journeys into the woods. Without me along, they took to the fields opposite the new highway. These stretched for miles back then and during the summer were laying fallow. Our part of Texas rides the line between prairie land and riparian forest. You may find yourself walking for miles on open land only to discover acres upon acres of woods between the next field. After walking for miles across nothing, they came upon a forested area most of us had yet to explore. A path led to an abandoned barn. When they turned the corner to look inside, they came face to face with the corpse of a hanged man. From what I was told later, not a one of them believed it to be real. However, as they got closer, there was no longer any doubt. The body was that of a trucker who had parked his 18-wheeler at the nearby truck stop around Christmas. He walked the three miles or so into the woods and ended his life. To this day, no one knows if he knew that barn was there or he just happened upon it. But we do know, on that hot, humid summer day, his bloated body posed a horrific sight to them. Realizing someone was likely missing him, my friends returned to the very same truck stop he had walked away from the year before and called the cops. Of course, I didn't hear all about this until the next day. Even though it did sound like an amazing adventure, I'm thankful I had to sit it out. All three of them went on to differing levels of legal and emotional troubles, including battles with addiction. The only one left living, Stephen, had spent several stints in and out of institutions and the last time we spoke little of my childhood friend remained. I can't claim that the discovery of the trucker's body was the only reason for their eventual decline, but it most certainly contributed to it. During the early 2000s when I was attending law school, I worked nights delivering pizza for one of the national chains. I had done something similar when I was younger and attending my local community college. Anytime I found myself sorely in need of quick cash, that was the avenue I would choose. Despite the many stories I have heard questioning the safety of the job, I never had a single run-in with a thief. I'm sure back in the early days it could be a little dangerous, but by the time I joined the game, companies had learned that implementing practices such as limiting the driver to $20 lowered the chance of holdups drastically. Even though I was never a victim of a robbery, I did have one or two scary incidents I could write about. The worst of these happened to me back in the 2000s. I was very familiar with the city I was living at at the time. Moving there after junior college and delivering for several places over the last five years had made me intimate with almost every nook and cranny of the place. However, one evening I would be called to an address that I, nor any of the other drivers even knew existed. When the order came in, I went straight to the map to find the address, but it wasn't there. Not even the GPS on my phone showed it. We didn't have any no-delivery areas at that time, so I had to take it despite my misgivings. Theoretically, the place would have existed if the road continued for ten more blocks, so I turned on to said road a block before its ending and followed it south. Sure enough, a newly paved road began where the old one should have ended. For what seemed like miles, I continued on this new section of road. Nothing stood on the other side of it and I didn't pass another car the whole time. 
How the state managed to build it without a single report of its creation leaking to the media had me bewildered. The five years I had been driving all over the city, I had not known this part existed. In one way, I was very excited seeing all of it, like a Victorian explorer tracing the sources of the Nile. But at the same time, a deserted road popping up out of nowhere gave me a chill down my spine. It must have been a good ten minutes before the house in question appeared in the distance. I couldn't understand why someone would build a house out here in the middle of nowhere with no way to reach it. When I got closer, I could see the house had to be at least 50 years old or more and probably hadn't been repaired since then. No cars were around and, for a moment, I thought the house was abandoned, but I could see the front door wide open behind the rickety old screen. Everything looked to be above board, so I grabbed the pizza and headed for the door. I knocked on the screen door but got no answer. I could see what appeared to be a young female walking around the kitchen. When I knocked a second time, I heard a female voice say to come in. Despite my reservations, I stepped just inside the house and waited in the small foyer. I had learned from other drivers early on not to enter an unfamiliar house, but I had yet to see anything to concern me. I assumed the woman would be coming out soon to pay me. Instead, I overheard an unseen man whisper, Call him into the kitchen. When I heard that, I fled from that place as fast as I could. I was so freaked out I got back to the restaurant in half the time it took me to get to the house. After I told my boss what had just occurred, he called the police. All the excitement had me rattled so my boss sent me home for the day. My phone rang a few hours later. It was the police. They would called to let me know what they had found. Whoever had been there was gone now. Even though the place had more than likely been abandoned for a while, they did find evidence that people had just recently been inside. This was stuff my boss had already told them. However, they did shed light on where the road came from and why the house was the only building on an otherwise deserted area. The state had been trying to purchase the land on which the new section of road and house were for 20 years, but the landowner wouldn't sell. They even tried to use eminent domain to get it, but a judge blocked it. Around two years before, the owner passed, and his children finally sold the land to the state. They were so happy to get the land after all that time, the construction on the road was started immediately. It technically had yet to be formally open, but locals had already began using it anyway. This was good to know, but I still wondered how the two people knew about the empty house sitting out in the middle of nowhere. This was something the officer didn't know. We could only assume they drove past it and decided it would be as good a place as any to ambush a delivery driver. Even $20 is a good score if you're desperate enough. He said from personal experience, people have killed for much less. The officer left me with one good piece of news though. The county had slated the old house to be demolished in the coming week, so no other poor delivery driver would be let out there to be robbed or worse. Two days later, I was driving down the brand new road which I was now using as a shortcut across town and witnessed the house's destruction. A load was even being lifted from my shoulders right before my eyes. Never again would I enter a customer's home or even deliver to an area in which I was not well versed. Perhaps in the future, I'll share my other story. While not as harrowing, it was still scary nonetheless. Because my parents had separated before I was born, I spent my time growing up between each of their houses. Each summer until I turned 19, I stayed with my dad in rural Missouri. He had grown up in the area himself and most of his family still lived there. Without much to do, like going to the movies and stuff, I would fill my days hanging out with my older cousin and getting into mischief. Many of our long summer days were taken in wandering the surrounding woods. On one of these journeys, we came across a big lake setting quietly by itself out in the middle of nowhere. The water was crystal clear and filled with tons of monstrous fish. We asked the adults if they were aware of its existence, but none had heard of it. 
That was probably the reason for it having so many large fish. No one living in the area had fished it and any who had in the past allowed its location to be lost. We would fish the pond three or four times, coming away with a stringer full of lunkers on each occasion. On the fifth occasion, we hoped to accumulate enough for a big family fish fry. The summer holiday was starting to wind down and we figured a fish fry would be a great way to cap it off. It was a warm Saturday morning when we headed out. We started about an hour before sunup because the walk-in took over an hour. Besides, the fish stopped biting by the hottest part of the day and we hoped to get back to my dad's house by early afternoon. The beautiful sight of the pond came into view around dawn. It didn't take long for us to get our first bites and for the next three hours the fish came quickly, one after another. Our limit was caught by 10.45 and I was rearing to get going. We had a 90 minute walk back with two 5 gallon buckets packed to the top with fish so I imagined another 30 could be added to that. To my displeasure my cousin thought it would be refreshing to take a dip in the lake before we left. He tried to pressure me into joining him but... I didn't know how to swim at the time. I just wanted to get back, but he was older than me, so he was in charge. I plopped my tail onto a rock and waited while he did his thing. There was an old rope tied to a tree, probably from a hundred years ago, and he wanted to swing from it. It looked unsafe to me. However, my concerns were laughed off, and he stripped down to his boxers, setting his clothes on the ground next to me. He climbed the tree a little way and grabbed the rope. Pushing off, he swung out just a short distance before the rope snapped right above him. He'd made it out far enough to hit the deep water, but probably not as far as he intended. When he hit the water, his body made a dull thud sound. It certainly didn't sound normal and likely hurt. I was planning on laughing at him and saying I told you so, but as the seconds pass, he never resurfaced. The situation was quickly becoming scary. I looked around to see if he came up somewhere farther away, perhaps floating unconscious because of the hard contact with the water, but still nothing. I began to panic and waded out as far as I dare looking into the water for him. Unfortunately, the water became cloudy with every step I took and made it impossible to see. Soon it was clear to me that he had drowned. How, I had no idea. Perhaps if I could have swum back then, I may have been able to help him, but it was too late now. I was helpless to do anything more than pack up and head home. On the entire walk back, a small nugget of hope lingered in the back of my mind that he had tricked me and would pop up at some point. This didn't happen, however, and the dread I carried of telling my family grew with each step. I tried several times to find the words, but with each attempt... I would break down and choke on my tears. Ultimately, I could only manage Mark drowned. They got the point after that, and once I was able to pull myself together, I led my dad and uncle back out to the pond. Mark's body was still nowhere to be found. With no other options, we went into the sheriff's office to report the drowning. When I realized where we were headed, I started freaking out. In my young mind, I thought it was going to get in trouble or be blamed for my cousin's death. It took a few minutes, but they were able to convince me I wasn't in trouble. Even after they had, I couldn't help but feel guilty every time I looked at my uncle. Regardless of what he claimed, I couldn't believe he didn't blame me, even if it was just a small amount. I explained what had happened to the sheriff and the search began the next morning. Just by chance, that was the day I was going back to my mom's. That Monday night, my mom sat me down to tell me that a team of divers had found Mark's body earlier that day. When they discovered him, one of his feet were hung up on a sunken log, so they assumed that was why he never resurfaced. I wish I could say this made me feel better, but it did not. It did, however, serve as a catalyst to learn how to swim, the guilt of not being able to help my cousin stayed with me for most of my life and I never wanted to be in the position of not being able to help another person ever again. So in a twisted kind of way, his death had a positive impact on my life. However, if I had the choice, I'd still prefer that he be with us.
Although what I'm about to tell you may sound like one of your run-of-the-mill horror movies, I swear by the validity of it and what I saw. It all started on a very hot July day this past year. My car is almost 20 years old and sometimes overheats on hot days, just like this one. However, until I get a better paying job, it's the car I'm stuck with. This day, I was driving through the back roads looking for a family of dog breeders a friend had told me about. i have been searching for the place for several hours and was approaching the warmest part of the day. As per usual, my car began overheating and I was forced to pull over. I picked up my phone to call my girlfriend only to see that my battery was dead. After I spent a couple of minutes cussing my luck, I acknowledged that I was going to have to find someone with a working phone. That wasn't going to happen unless I started walking. Soon, I spotted an old farmhouse off in the distance and headed toward it. A trip that would have taken half an hour on a normal day took almost an hour because of the oppressive heat. I had to take several breaks during the course of the journey, but eventually made it. The area around the house looked more like a junkyard. Parts of old cars spread about, and I had to weave through a maze of them to reach the front door. I knocked on the door for several minutes, but got no answer. Thinking maybe that the homeowner may be hard of hearing, I walked around and looked into the windows hoping to see someone inside. At the side of the house, I spotted the telephone hanging on the wall just inside the kitchen. Now that I knew that there was a phone, I became excited and started calling out for someone. Even after walking all the way around, no reply came. I was about to give up until I saw a woman lying on a bed. I very nearly banged on the window to try and get her attention, but I figured that may scare her, so I went to the front door and let myself in. Now in hindsight, that was just as scary. But before I entered, however, I took a piece of paper from a notebook I carry with me and wrote out a note explaining what I was doing there. Even then, I called out several times as I approached the bedroom. Still no answer came and I continued toward the room. The closer I got to the woman, the more her appearance began to unnerve me. She was laying flat on her back and staring blankly at the ceiling. I had initially believed she was watching the television that was turned on in the room with her, but her eyes sat completely still. Regardless, I got closer and, once I was within a few steps, handed her the note. When the note touched her hand, she didn't react. This caused me to get closer and this was when I realized something was very wrong. Her face had a very dry, almost mummified look to it. Her hair was a vibrant black, a color not often seen on older females. She had to have known I was there by that point, but her eyes stayed fixed. This is what caused me to lean in even closer and look into her eyes. Rather than being slightly bloodshot or moist looking like most people's, they had a shiny, glassy appearance, like they were fake. In spite of this, not until I actually touched her did I know for sure that she was dead. I realized that perhaps she was a mannequin rather than a human, so I reached down to touch her bare hand. The texture of her skin was dry, but stone cold to the touch. The oddity of this was just beginning to really sink in, when a loud creaking noise came from behind me. Without a second thought, I tore out of there and ran back down the road in the direction of my car. Within a half of a mile, I ran into an older man in a truck, and thankfully he agreed to give me a ride back into town. I said nothing about my experience to him, and any time he attempted to make small talk, I said as little as I could, on the off chance that he may have been involved in what happened to that woman. He let me borrow his phone to call my girlfriend and she agreed to meet us at a gas station on the edge of town. When he let me out there, I thanked him and he went on his way. Once I was safely inside my girlfriend's car, I borrowed her phone to call the police. I hadn't even told her about it yet, so the look of shock on her face as I described what I saw showed me what my expression likely was at the time I discovered it. The cops said they'd send out a car to the house to check out my claims. I called a wrecker next to pick up my car. The police never called me back, so after waiting three days, I called to inquire about what they found. 
It took a few minutes to find a person aware of my call, but once I did, the officer said that he and his partner searched the entire property and found nothing out of the ordinary, especially not a mummified woman. I thanked them and hung up. What happened after I fled, I can only guess. The noise behind me was probably the owner of the home, and he hid the woman's body knowing that the cops were likely to be called. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I saw in that house, on that bed. I am positive that I saw a human lying on that bed, but that's all. More than once, I've been tempted to grab a camera and return to the house to get proof of my claims, but fear of the unknown and what else could be waiting for me if I did has stopped me. If the nightmares of her soulless eyes continue, however, I may have no other choice. I was hired to do a catalog shoot for a national company. The shoot was scheduled for August of 2014 in rural Montana. When the time came, I flew in and was driven to a quaint lodge in the mountains in which the shoot was based out of. I was introduced to the lady running the shoot from the company side. We had worked together once or twice in the past, and I was happy to be working with her again. Her and I were soon joined by her assistant. The three of us spoke for a short time before I was shown to my accommodations. I had arrived late in the day, so after eating a small dinner I turned in. The next morning everyone involved with the shoot, maybe twelve people in all, met in a large hall for breakfast. Upon the completion of our meal, myself, the lady running the shoot, and her assistant got into a jeep and went in search of shooting locations. The models and a couple of other people I don't remember followed us in another. After an hour or more of driving, I spotted a beautiful rocky outcropping and we set things up. The lighting was fantastic on that day, so very little extra work was needed to get the shots I was looking for. A few hours later, I was done with that location. It was time for lunch anyway. The jeep with the models returned to the lodge. However, my counterpart convinced me to check out a breathtaking area she'd seen on a walk the day before. She said she had arrived early in the morning and decided to take a walk before my plane landed. This sounded fine to me and she insisted it wasn't that far. We'd be back for lunch soon after the others, no problem. After a five minute drive, we made it to the location. She led us about a hundred yards down a trail that ended on a sheer ledge. No doubt it was a gorgeous spot, but I could see without the right light, the photos wouldn't be able to do it justice. I mentioned this, and she walked closer to the edge to get a better look. She went out much further than I would have recommended. However, I guess she was more occupied with her work than with her safety. After taking one step too many, the loose rock of the cliff broke free, causing her to tumble down the sheer cliff. Her assistant, this cute and kind little girl, rushed forward, and if I had not stopped her, possibly would have followed her employer down the hill. Instead, I had her get a strong hold on me, and I slowly and carefully scooted toward the remaining ledge. I took in a big breath and let it out, then looked over to see the poor woman curled up about 75 feet from us. She didn't move at first, and I feared the worst. However, the longer I stared at her, I began to see her body make small, almost indistinguishable movements. I let her assistant know this and asked if she could drive. She said yes, so I told her to run back to the jeep and get help. Quicker than lightning, she ran down the trail and a moment later I could see the jeep flying down the road in the direction of the lodge. Even if she was unable to respond, I wanted her to know help was on the way. I yelled down to her and could only hope she could hear what I was saying. The minutes seemed to drag on but within half an hour a rescue team arrived to help. The two men were lowered down with a special stretcher and they attached her to it. When she was raised back to the top, it was clear that she was badly injured, but still alive. An ambulance took her away and all was left was the waiting. The shoot was obviously on hold until a decision was made on how to proceed. It was ultimately decided to cancel, at least for the foreseeable future, and that was the end of my part in this awful mess. I received no news for a few months, but then I got a call from her. 
The last nine weeks had been a near nightmare for herself and her family. The initial swelling on her brain was so bad she was put into a coma. This would eventually pass, but the long hours of being stuck in bed almost drove her crazy. The list of broken bones in her body went well into the double digits, and even at the time we were speaking, she was still working on crutches. Over the years since the accident, her and I have kept in contact. At the time of me writing this, she had five surgeries on various bones and parts of her body and will no doubt have several more before she dies. Despite the awful violence of the fall and the long, agonizing convalescence she suffered through, she still hasn't lost her sense of humor. On her last call just a week ago, she said if she could do it all over again, she might pick a shorter distance to fall from. A true heroine, if I've ever seen one. This had to have happened sometime in the early 2000s. My husband was still spending most of the time on the road working for one of the major insurance companies. As a result of this, myself and our young daughter spent the majority of our days alone. A few years prior, we had purchased a new home on a somewhat isolated piece of land, and the journey between town and home could often be harrowing, especially at times of heavy rain. Most of the last five miles of the road that led to the house was nothing more than loose gravel and wasn't very wide for that matter. My daughter and I found ourselves stuck on this section of road on a really bad night. I did all that I could to keep our old Subaru on the road, but the rain made visibility almost impossible. It wasn't long until I misjudged one curve and ended up in the ditch. Fortunately, my husband had the foresight to sign us up to one of those roadside assistant programs. I contacted them and was told that the weather was keeping them busy, but they would get to us as soon as possible. Not knowing how long we'd be stuck there, I made my daughter as comfortable as I could and waited. The rain stopped soon after and I was now able to see how far away from home we were. I estimated it was about two and a half miles to the house and considered walking, until remembering no one was at home to retrieve the car later. Help was on its way, so I could wait. Within ten minutes of the accident, I could see the headlights of a truck coming towards us and began to get excited. However, it didn't turn out to be a tow truck. Instead, it was an older man driving a rusty pickup. When he saw the car, he slowed down and looked into it as he passed. I thought he was about to offer to pull us out, but he continued down the road. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but five minutes later, the rusty truck approached us coming from the other direction at a very slow speed. He stared at me once again as he passed, even making eye contact with me briefly, but didn't stop. Things were beginning to look odd, but I thought maybe he was lost and turning around to return to the highway. He wasn't obligated to help. Perhaps he thought I was parked instead of stuck. He probably wasn't from around there and was just trying to get home like I was. Things didn't start to get scary until I noticed the same truck coming toward us for a third time. It had gotten completely dark by this point and most women I know feel much less safe once the sun goes down. This situation made things even more sketchy. He did his usual by now slow drive-by. What was different this time was that he stopped the truck after he passed and did a quick three-point turn in the road. He was now facing us again, stopped about ten yards away. Rather than get out and come over to offer aid, he sat in the cab and watched for a few minutes. Only now did he open the door and begin to get out of the truck. Almost as soon as his foot hit the pavement, a pair of headlights appeared from the other direction. The man stayed where he was just watching and waiting for a minute before it was close enough to see it was a tow truck. Once he saw this, he jumped back in his cab and made a quick U-turn and sped away from us. My heart was stuck in my throat as I watched this play out, and not until I could read the name of the company on the side of the tow truck could I begin to relax. The tow truck driver didn't hesitate to pull his truck in front of us and hook up to my car. I was finally confident he was there to help, and I got out to thank him. He had us out of the ditch in a few minutes, and we were on our way. 
For the remainder of the journey, I kept my eyes open for the rusty truck, and even as I drove up our drive, I feared I'd see him lying in wait for me. He was not, thankfully, and I got my daughter into the house for the night. When my husband returned from his latest trip, I told him about what had happened during the last storm, but I left out the part with the strange truck. I knew it would only make him more stressed when he was away, and at that time, he had no other choice but to continue his trips. Because of this latest trouble, he went out and purchased an almost new Jeep with a 4x4 transmission for me. I was over the moon to get it, and I never got stuck again, even on the muddy parts of our property. It didn't take long for the stranger in the rusty truck to pass from my mind. However, for the next two weeks I caught myself looking for it any time I was on that stretch of road. I had almost completely forgotten about that incident until just recently when I saw a truck similar to it at the store. It, of course, was not the same one, but it caused it all to come flooding back and motivated me to write this. Fortunately, in the preceding years since then, the county has paved and widened the roads and my wonderful husband gets to come home to us every night. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.